Um, I know that um, Friday afternoons in Washington, D.C. are a challenge, so this shows your commitment to um, this topic, and thank you very much. And just to let you know, there were a number of people that reached out to us who um, were not able to join and have asked if we could video this so that they could watch it um, live stream as well as be available later, especially for field teams or country teams or those who, who cannot um, watch it live. So we will arrange to have it available on the website so that it can be watched. Um, you can share it with your groups. And I know the Burma team, on um, an earlier event that Angelina was a panelist on resilience, shared it with your team and had a discussion around it. So we, we um, asked, um, Dr. Jawad to give a very detailed presentation. It'll be about 40 minutes so that there'll be enough substance there for folks who were not able to be here that they'll be able to pick up on it. And um, after his presentation, we'll have a question and answer. And we intentionally kept this small so that we know that in an earlier event, there wasn't enough time and um, to have people have a discussion and ask questions about your programs or things that you were curious about. So there'll be plenty of time for that. So please don't even hesitate um, to do that. So I'd like to just do a few introductory comments. Um, my name's Colette Rausch, and I'm a senior advisor here at USIP. And um, the event today is a discussion with Dr. Ali Jawad on epigenetics, the role of childhood and intergenerational trauma and protracted conflicts. And what I'd like to just briefly say is to talk about um, Dr. Jawad's background. And he is a physician scientist with training in neuroscience. He's currently at the Brain Research Institute at the University of Zurich and is, leading an expert, is a leading expert in the field of intergenerational trauma. Dr. Jawad has also recently contributed to a chapter on epigenetics to USIP's edited volume on neuroscience and peace building that is currently um, going through the peer review process. And that's how we came to know each other. He was the lead author on a chapter that is going to discuss in detail what he'll talk about today. He's a strong proponent for using science for humanitarian causes that are not only limited to disease pre prevention and therapeutics, but also for the resolution of human conflicts and peace building. His research and focus on neuroepigenetics and trauma is a critical component of his work to stimulate innovative ideas and approaches to prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflict. In light of the complexity of today's crises and the number of protracted violent conflicts that we're seeing around the world and many of you are working on um, on a daily basis, he will discuss what peace builders can learn from the field of epigenetic inheritance to help restore peace and resilience and prosperity to individuals and communities. Efforts such as these will help pave the way for greater and deeper social transformation that is required if we're going to be able to have sustainable peace in the world. And again, thank you for joining us um, for what I know will be a very thoughtful presentation. And as I mentioned, we very much look forward to the discussion afterwards and getting any answers to your burning questions. And Dr. Jawad's also offered up his business cards. So if afterwards um, a question comes up or if you go back and you know watch the video and something comes up, um, I will be sure to give you his card. So I would now like to turn it over to Dr. Jawad. All right. Um, thank you very much, Khaled. This has been an absolute honor and a pleasure uh, to be here. Um, so what I'll be talking over the next 40 minutes or so is there's a story which you don't normally hear in academic conferences because we get a bit carried away with the uh, you know with the whole charm of being in an academic setting in which it's about curiosity it's about novelty but somehow the compassion component is not highlighted enough but what you would see is that what this research has taught us is not only about biology, I mean, there has been a significant conceptual advance, of course, about biology and heritability and from a neuroscience perspective, but it has taught us a lot about society and humanity and the things which we need to stop overlooking and the things which we need to be 
aware of if we want a sustainable, like harmonious and peace-loving environment. Um, I'll be talking about science, but I will be trying my best to communicate at a level where all of us can relate to each other. Um, I'm going to stand up. I just always find it easier. So, you know, a lot of us are, of course, interested in this topic of childhood trauma, and for very fair and very like valid reasons. Um, but like, not all of us read side effect journals, and not all the scientists who are working on trauma or who are working on epigenetic inheritance are communicating to the people like you who actually matter. So what I did was I was like, let's approach it in a different way. Let's approach it like how my nephew, who's 15 year old, would approach something. You know, you start from Google, right? So, and then whenever you start by searching any topic on Google, you get some listings, and then you get maps, and then you get images. So if you look up childhood trauma, these are the images you guys would probably find. Children, suffering, conflicts. Um, pretty much this this agony on the on the faces of these children, which which induces enough empathy, and then what we see is something like this. Oh, sorry. Did we? Yeah. So we see things which um, are not related to the science of childhood trauma, but things which are impacting humanity at a very large level, at a policy-making level, at a conflict level. And we see that the population which is most vulnerable in the face of these world conflicts is actually the population of children. And we see children being detained, whether it's, it's in China, it's the immigration crisis, whether it's um, in, in Kashmir, in India, we see that wherever there is a conflict, the population which is suffering the most is the population of children. How many of you know about this girl? Probably everyone, right? I mean, everyone working at USIP I would assume, would know about the Afghan girl. Now, there have been like controversies that the, the agony you see on her face was actually something more acute, because apparently the journalist who, who took the photograph was, was very condescending towards her. Regardless of that, you definitely see a lot of pain in those eyes. And what I'm going to show you next is that it probably stayed with her. It probably still is a part of her. And it probably even got passed on to her own children. And this is what we study. This is what we study from a more biological standpoint. And what we have found out is that what happens in childhood, it doesn't always stay in childhood. It's something which is persistent. It's something which has very wide-ranging effects, and you, you would see that trauma, which we consider to be um, an emotional experience, it actually has a lot of outcomes which are purely physical, which are, which are at the very biochemical level, which is, which is affecting the, you know, the juices we are made of, practically, the primordial juices. And this is something which we have gone on to discover that this, these effects are not only persistent over a lifetime, but a lot of these are transmitted across generations. Now, long before, um, like you know, I got got involved in this excellent initiative, um, you know, with USIP, I was trying to link science to world conflicts, and um, one of the one of the little propositions I had was published in Science back in 2013, where, um, so originally I come from Pakistan, and what I tried to propose was that, you know, with this whole war against terror and, uh, and the crisis which we had, the Pakistan and Afghan border, the, the population which is suffering the most is actually children. And we need to intervene before a war orphan picks up a gun himself or herself. Um, and that we need to think and approach this question this, this crisis in a more scientific manner, 
where we come we need to come up with neuropsychological predictive models of what kind of effects witnessing a war would have on these children and what kind of interventions we need to enrich their environment before they start exhibiting exclusionist behaviors themselves because that is what we often see another initiative i worked on was to promote human rights through science um and there were a couple of scientific journals who were very um i would say i would actually say that they were kind enough to cater to these ideas because generally scientific journals don't they do not want to step out of this little bubble of academia where where they're usually like you know very happy to be in and then i actually started working on traumatic stress uh both for personal and professional reasons years ago um when i was actually um at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston Texas and i had this horrible hairstyle as you can see over here um and i worked on traumatic stress and ptsd back then and we had a population of veterans who had um served in the vietnam war um and we wanted to see that what kind of physical manifestations they would have years after so we had a population of elderly they were veterans above the age of 65 um some of them were coming for routine healthcare some of them were coming for dementia screenings and we started taking their history at the broader level and we started implicating you know the effects of trauma and the post traumatic stress they had with that um there are a few things which are important to keep into mind when you go into traumatic stress and one of them is that there are specific vulnerability periods um early postnatal periods and then uh, especially in boys what we call the slow growth period this period of 9 to 11 years and then later on the the periods of adolescence the brain is particularly sensitive to any kind of stimuli and now those stimuli can also be positive but here we are focusing on the effects of traumatic stress that is where any event any traumatic event could have long lasting impact um now here we are talking about the effects on an individual but then later on you will see that these effects are actually also getting transmitted across generations right so in the study of veterans um what we did was that we divided them into two categories those who had experienced trauma um and we sort of isolated that group we identified that group based on whether someone had a purple heart recommendation or not so purple heart um was like usually given i think until a couple of years ago it was usually given to veterans who experienced any physical injury any physical injury requiring medical assistance now it's also being given to people who um experience like you know significant emotional trauma requiring psychological help but at that time we focused on trauma in this purple heart group and then we had also had a group in which veterans served but they did not have a purple heart recommendation now not everyone who experiences trauma develops ptsd some do and the others don't and we looked at these groups as well so this is the group with purple heart and they develop ptsd and this is a group in which there is purple heart but they did not develop ptsd so they showed you could say you know as in layman terminology they showed more resilience they were resistant to the long term effects of trauma then we also had groups in which there was no purple heart recommendation but still there was ptsd coming from other sources so this was not war trauma but this was ptsd based on some other trauma exposure and finally a group in which there was no exposure to trauma so there was no purple heart and then there was no ptsd now what we found out was that irrespective of where ptsd was coming from irrespective of whether the trauma was leading to ptsd or not we saw an increased incidence in prevalence of diabetes hyperlipidemia and like you know their their eventual outcomes in terms of stroke and cerebrovascular accidents so basically all different cardiovascular diseases metabolic disorders were much more common in individuals who experience trauma in the form of purple heart who experienced ptsd irrespective of trauma or who had purple heart and then developed ptsd but you would appreciate that 
in the group where we have both Purple Heart and PTSD, the incidence is actually the highest. And this is our control group, no Purple Heart, no PTSD, where the incidence is the lowest. We did some statistical modeling to actually look at the effects, look at like, you know, um, what was the proportion, what was the risk factor which was increasing in these individuals. And you would see that compared to controls, um, you know, the group with the Purple Heart, the group with the PTSD, the risk of developing these disorders was much higher, like, you know, sometimes even reaching up to more than two folds. Now, this was work on veterans who experience trauma in adulthood. Um, from literature, from biology, we knew that there are periods of susceptibility which are even before, during childhood and adolescence, which are implicated. We started looking at like some of the, the work of some of the other people. And actually, one person who stands out in that is Rachel Yehuda in Mount Sinai, who had looked at trauma and Holocaust survivors. Um, and what she reported was that not only were the effects of trauma persistent in these survivors, but a lot of these effects were getting transmitted to their offspring. Um, and then it led to a lot of different, you know, the headlines in New York Times and some of the other magazines where she showed that um, the study of Holocaust survivors, they pass on trauma to their children, even affects their genes that uh, there is parental PTSD, which is affecting the healthy aging of the, of the offspring. And similarly, descendants of Holocaust survivors have altered stress hormones. And she showed that this was present not only in the offspring of Holocaust survivors, but even in the grand offspring of Holocaust survivors. Now, she does a lot of uh, psychology and psychiatry work. And um, while she made that observation, there were no like you know molecular mechanisms which were identified behind and that's where our work comes into play and that's where we take the lead so if trauma is something which is transmissible then how is it transmissible and that's where i would open up the question to all of you just very quickly so what do you think, with which, which means do you think could be, uh, which mechanisms could be responsible for this transmission? So one possibility, of course, is that, you know, parents who experience trauma themselves, maybe they just turn out to be bad parents, right? That's one possibility. And, of course, that could be the case. That is indeed the case on many occasions. But then there is a mechanism which is much more um, actually likely affected, as we know now, and where we could come up with more straightforward predictions. And that is that there is a transmission of these effects which is based on epigenetics, which is based on what we call the interaction between the nature and nurture. So epigenetics, to put it simply, is the study of changes which are heritable. So these are changes which are acquired by a cell or an individual and then are passed on. Now, the process is not as simple as it seems. You know, There are things which are occurring at the level of genetics. You know, So we all inherit things from our parents, right? So how is epigenetics different? So epigenetics is different because in epigenetics, the initial change, the initial insult is occurring in the very first generation. It is leading to a number of molecular changes. We don't need to go into details of that. But these changes are occurring in all different cells of the body, including the germline. And they are leading to some specific phenotypic changes, so some specific symptoms. Um, so you could say that there can be an exposure in the parent, you know, let's, let's imagine like a 30-year-old individual who experiences trauma. The trauma would lead to some changes in that individual which will, be, which will leave their signatures in different cells of the body, including the germline, which in case of this individual, this gentleman would be the sperm. 
Now, when this guy like eventually has children of his own, then these changes are transmitted, leading to the same symptoms with this individual had. Although the initial environmental insult, initial trauma exposure is not there. And then this is carried on across generations, even when the stressor was only present in the previous generation. So this is where it differs from genetics, because this is a change induced by an experience, and it is like you know, constantly transmitted through these cycles of reproduction. Now we know now, based on primarily animal research, that a lot of different environmental exposures are transmissible like this. These exposures are not necessarily bad. I mean, I'm going to start with something positive because we now know that exercise in the parents lead to beneficial metabolic outcomes in offspring. But then there are other things like high fat diet, a negative exposure, which leads to increased disease susceptibility in the offspring. Exposure to toxins like jet fuels, plastic waste, etc. All these exposures in the parents, especially when they are at a certain threshold level, they lead to changes in the cells, which then are like you know getting transmitted to the offspring. And finally, the work on early life trauma, which. I'll go more detail into. So when we focus on the epigenetic inheritance of trauma, again, the principle is that the trauma exposure is on like you know the uh, the first generation. I'm showing it the, the the mouse work here, but then you will see that all of this is also applicable in humans. It is causing a multitude of changes. So like, you know, in the circulation, in the blood, in body fluids, a lot of things get changed after the exposure to trauma. The hormones, the chemicals in the brain, the chemicals in the periphery, in the blood, things like cytokines, things which are induced by inflammation, all of these get altered. And then these chemical changes in the blood, they are leading to some very strong molecular changes in the germline, which then manifests as different symptoms across these different generations. We learned all of that by working on a mouse model of trauma, which you would see is very close to many different scenarios of human childhood trauma. Um, it's based on impaired maternal care. And what happens in this model is that during the first two weeks of life, so postnatal day 1 to 14, which would roughly be equivalent to, um, like, you know, in, 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 in terms of human lifespan, a child until the age of, like, around 12, 13 years, um, these little bubs, they are subjected to separation from their mothers for three hours every day. Now that is done in an unpredictable fashion, so that seems to be something which the which these animals are not used to. They they feel forced to do that. And at the same time, the mother is stressed. So during this period of separation, the mother is placed into cold water. Now mice they do like water, they just don't like when the water is cold. You know, so that leads to stress in mice. And then you see um, you see that in their behavior, you see that also in their hormonal profiles, that they are extremely stressed. This combination, this dual hit of maternal separation and maternal stress leads to an impaired maternal care for these mice, which continues during the time when they are receiving milk from the mothers, during the time when you know, they are depending on the nurturing from the mothers for their early development. When these mice grow to be adults, they have a lot of different neurobehavioral manifestations. So we see that they are more anxious. We see that they are more depressed. We see that they uh, indulge in more risk-taking behaviors. Um, and then not only there are these neurocognitive symptoms, but we also see that there are changes in their glucose and their cholesterol. So their, their fat levels in the circulation 
would be very similar to, to, to a mouse which has fed high fat diet for a long time. So now these mice, they're not given any special diet, they're given the regular diet, but they start showing manifestations of someone who would be fed like you know this unhealthy diet. Similarly, they have changes in their glucose metabolism level. They show like a phenotype where they are very sensitive to the effects of hypoglycemia. So whenever their sugar levels drop, they're not able to recover from those. These are the different manifestations which we see in these mice. So you see that they are very sensitive to any further environmental insult. The most important thing is that these symptoms are not only present in the exposed mice, but when these mice grow to be adults, when they mate with like you know, the wild type naive mice, the resulting offspring shows similar manifestations. So trauma in the parent mouse is leading to all these different symptoms in the, in the baby mouse. And actually this is something which we now know is getting transmitted down to four generations. And in fact, um, I have a colleague who's now studying the fifth generation and there might be even you know, some negative effects getting transmitted up to the fifth generation. We also know that this transmission uh, one of the mechanisms which you have identified is that it is dependent on changes in the RNA of the sperm. So these, these are not changes which are genetic. So these are not, you know, we all, like, you know, from high school, we all remember that DNA has a sequence, right? This um, sort of this ABCD kind of like sequence. That sequence is not altered, but the way the genes manifest themselves is altered. And if we took, you know, this, this sort of um, these epigenetic marks from the germline of the mice and you injected them, you know, into a developing embryo, you would be able to transmit those changes. So this is something which is functioning at the epigenetic level and it is not psychological transmission only. So what happens? What happens to these mice or their offspring? And that is something which, which I want to go more, like you know, into into more detail of because I think this is also very applicable to humans. And later on, when I talk about the human study, you would see that trauma is something that nature has somehow kept it in a way that the way trauma affects mice and humans is actually not so much different from each other. So we can learn a lot by studying trauma in mice, which is applicable to humans. So we all know that mice are nocturnal animals. They prefer staying in the dark. Um, but these mice who were subjected to early life trauma, they kind of, you know, in a way, the nurture is affecting their, uh, their nature. Because what we observe is that these mice prefer staying for longer in the brightly lit compartment, which we uh, interpret as increased risk-taking behavior. Now, in certain scenarios, this might even be beneficial because maybe, if you think about it, taking these risks could, in certain scenarios could be advantageous for these mice because it means more access to food and like you know, other amenities they look for. But definitely what we see is the trauma is affecting their nature, making them more of risk takers. But then there are some other things where there are no advantages. For example, we see that they start showing these tendencies which are very similar to the tendencies which we see in depressed patients. So when you, play, when you would place like a non-traumatized mouse in cold water, they try to escape. You see this behavior that they are trying to get out of the beaker. You know, their survival instinct kind of kicks in and they are trying to escape the beaker of cold water. Um, what happens in these traumatized mice is that they keep on floating as if they've given up on life, as if they're okay with that. They don't want to try to escape that, that scenario where pretty much death is imminent. So this is very similar to suicidal tendencies which we see in depressed individuals. Their social interactions go down. Like the mice who have been subjected to trauma, they do not interact with their species that much anymore. Their navigational skills go down, so they're generally, we see also cognitive impairment in which they show um, defects in their memory, but importantly, their navigational skills go down. So now, you know, if you, if you try to correlate the things here, what we saw was that they're taking more risks, right? But because 
their cognitive skills and their navigational skills are down, these risks are probably not likely to lead to any kind of positive outcome because they do not have the cognition to support these risk-taking behaviors. Lastly, what we see is that um, they become more vulnerable. So, you know, mice, uh, they live in these communities where they establish hierarchies where one mouse becomes the leader of the other mice. What we see in these traumatized mice are that somehow are not fitting in this hierarchical system anymore. So they get a lot into fights, and this mouse, you know, the, the, the poor guy who's getting beaten up, is the one who was traumatized early in life, or his, uh, like, you know, his or her parents were traumatized early in life. So you see that they are not somehow fitting in these community systems anymore. Now, if you think about it, you know, for me, like, you know, it's very, it's very intuitive to think that we see a lot of similar behaviors in populations of humans who were subjected to trauma in children anymore. We see exclusionist behaviors. We see that they get depressed. We see, we see that they start taking more risks. They show, like, a lot of these borderline-like manifestations. Um, and then, yeah, like, this, this sort of not fitting into the community is also something which we see a lot in people who are subjected to trauma early in life. Now here, it's not only the direct exposure, but also something which is coming from the parents. Importantly, um, besides these neurobehavioral changes, we also see changes in their metabolism. You know, like we previously mentioned that they are showing, you know, um, like like a phenotype, like a symptoms which are very similar to someone who has been fed, uh, fed on high fat diet. So what we see is that in these mice, their good cholesterol, which is the HDL, that goes down, you know. So there are two different types of cholesterols, the, the, the good one, which is HDL, and the bad one, which is LDL. So we see that typically their good cholesterol starts going down. Now, importantly, HDL does not only have nutritional value, but it also is a carrier of different regulatory molecules in the blood, in the, generally in the body. These molecules are called microRNAs. I won't go into too much details of that, but the important thing to know is that these molecules they have a regulatory role. So they are present in the blood, they can travel from one tissue to another tissue, and they can go and regulate the gene expression in the other tissue. So for example, there have been studies where they've shown that there are these regulatory molecules which are released from the fats in the body, from the adipose deposits, the, the, the fat stores in the body. They go to the liver, and they cause fatty liver disease by just regulating the genes in the liver. So that's why these changes in the, in the HDL are very important because not only do they increase the susceptibility to all these cardiovascular illnesses, but they can potentially affect how these regulatory molecules in the blood can go and affect other tissue. Now, we were interested in finding out if these changes are also mediating the central effects of trauma to the germline. Because, you know, trauma is something which, which initially affects the brain. That's how, that's where the perception arises. But then if we see that the effects are getting transmitted, it means germline is affected. So what is connecting the brain to the germline? The blood. And these cholesterol changes in the blood could be very relevant to that. So in order to study that further, what we did was that we took the blood from these MSUS mice, the traumatized mice. We took the blood and then we injected it into the mice which were not exposed to trauma. And what we saw was that just by doing these blood injections, we were able we were able to recapitulate the symptoms which the trauma was having in these mice. Now again, think about the implications of this work. Think about 
like you know the the possible impact of blood transfusions think about like you know all these different um, uh, like symptoms they could that could be induced by that and how many times do we screen like you know the blood for traumatic exposures or dietary exposures before doing the transfusion anyways moving on so we found out that blood is a potential mediator of these effects and the blood cholesterol especially is more likely to be implicated the next question was that okay in mice, we have found out this pathway. Um, it seems like you know that we have strong evidence in support of this, but how do we apply it to humans? Now, one thing which, um, like I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard about that, is that you know laboratory mice they are very similar. You know, they are genetically very similar compared to humans who are very diverse. The reason mice are genetically very similar is because they are subjected to what we call inbreeding. You know, um, they are always mating, practically in case of mice, with their siblings, and that is why they do not diversify too much. There are advantages to keep the mice like that because then, uh, you know, our inferences can be stronger, and we do not see like changes which are dependent on the diversification at the genetic level. So when we wanted to um, validate the findings which we have from the mouse model to humans, the first challenge was to identify a population of humans which were also genetically very, like, you know, homogenous. Secondly, the, the challenge was to um, study an exposure which was very similar to the trauma exposure in mice. Um, the reason why we had to do that was because we wanted the academic community to appreciate our work. It was clear to me even before that all of this has strong implications for humanity, but first it was important to convince the academic community. So that's where actually where I come from um, turned out to be helpful because uh, besides some other unique features, um, what is very relevant for for Pakistan in terms of uh, you know scientific studies is that the population is genetically very homogenous the reason why it is very homogenous is because it has the highest rate of consanguinity in the world so they have been marrying like you know cousin marriages have been very common in Pakistan for hundreds and hundreds of years um, and because of that the population has the highest rate of consanguinity. They're all sort of distant cousins. So this becomes very similar to the mouse model. And then in Pakistan, we collaborated with the SOS Children's Village. Um, because we wanted to study trauma in children and something which was very similar to our mouse model, we were able to identify similar cohorts while working with the SOS Village. And what we work on, what we worked on in the SOS Village is this cohort of children who had paternal loss and maternal separation. Um, now these are the children who unfortunately lost their fathers very early in life. Um, and you know, they are losing their fathers. So it means that for their mothers there is the um, you know the grief, the bereavement stress of spousal death. And then, because of the social dynamics in Pakistan, the socioeconomic dynamics in Pakistan, the mothers were not able to raise the children on their own. So they had to give up their children for adoption by the SOS village. So there is this component of forced maternal separation combined with maternal stress. Now, this is very similar to, to the exposure, the trauma exposure we have in mice. Um, some of our work was actually recently published in Science, and the reason I'm highlighting that is because I realized the importance of communicating your work to somebody who's not from Science. Because somehow the way they make the point about your work is much more relatable. And this this was actually written by like Andrew Curry. He um, he has written for 
New York Times before, very nice guy. He's like German American and he he spent a lot of time like, you know, practically trying to learn what I was doing or what like, you know, my my previous boss Isabel Mansui was doing. He wanted pictures of the children. He wanted me to make videos of the children, record their experiences. And then like he wrote a feature actually which was um I think which has been way stronger than any of our scientific papers. Because just the choice of words he used, just the advocacy he did, it has been very well received. And I think now finally people are talking about work in like um in a much stronger sense. Right. So in these children, like roughly like around 80 children, which we have in our cohort, uh, first we wanted to ensure that there was nothing which was very unique about them in terms of their demographics, you know, which could be affecting their symptomatology. So we found a control group of children which um, were comparable to our children with trauma in terms of age, gender, as well as body mass index. So body mass index over here, it serves as a proxy for the dietary intake. So, you know, going with the idea that if they're maintaining their body mass index, then they are not malnourished, at least at the macronutrient level, and that would not be affecting any of our results. Finally, the, the consanguinity in the parents was also more or less similar in both the groups. Now, what we found out was that when we screen these children for depression, very similar to what we see in mice, we see much higher susceptibility towards depression, much higher severity of the pro-depressive symptoms in these children. We then screened them through validated uh, tests for anxiety for different psychological uh, manifestations of anxiety. And again, we found out that they are more prone to have generalized anxiety disorder. Um, they show a trend towards having more panic symptoms, and they also show the social anxiety-related deficits. Um, similar to what we saw in mice, also the metabolism is affected. Uh, you know, the, the cholesterol levels in these children are very similarly affected to what, saw, what we saw in mice. Um, and importantly, again, this is not based on dietary intake because when you look at them, like you know, physique-wise, they are comparable. It's just that internally something is happening which is affecting their metabolism in a negative way. Um, they also show inflammation, so we made sure that none of the children we assessed were like you know having an active infection at the time of assessment. But we still see that there is a chronic low-grade inflammation in these children. Their inflammatory markers were higher compared to their um, schoolmates who were living with their parents. Then we also saw that there were deficiencies or excessive amounts of different electrolytes, different salts in the body, which of course shows that the effects were at a very wide physiological level. And then importantly, um, this is actually one of my master students who, who helped me out in this project, and she found out that some of these microRNAs, some of these regulatory molecules which are present in the blood and can um, sort of regulate gene expression in distal tissue, they were altered in this human population as well. So now we are seeing changes at the epigenetic level which are very strong, which are very prominent, which could lead to susceptibility to diseases and they are present in this larger human cohort. And we also found out that some of these changes are actually, you know, they are sustainable over a long period of time because we not only studied children, but we also studied some of the former residents of the SOS village who are young adults now who had just crossed 18 and had just left the SOS village. But when we sampled their blood and when we looked for these regulatory molecules, we saw also abnormalities in those. Okay. Right, so all of this was, um, you know, changes in the blood, um, which could affect, which could be affecting different tissue, but it was important for us to show that it is likely that these changes are getting transmitted to the germline. So that's where 
we did a combination of uh, like you know some in vivo work, you know what we call scientifically things in which we study the whole organism, versus in vitro work where we take the cells out of an individual or out of an animal and we study them in a petri dish. So we looked at the effect of these changes in the blood on the germ cell-like cells which were present in a petri dish. And we found out that some of these changes were actually getting transmitted. And when these changes were getting transmitted, they were showing a dependence on this specific receptor, which is the receptor for cholesterol in the body. So it seems like cholesterol had a huge role in mediating these effects of trauma early in life to eventually um, how the germline could be affected. This is some additional work where we also saw changes in different metabolites. Again, everything is sort of getting connected to this fat metabolism um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bigger picture. And finally, this is like a very important study. And the way it also came about is very important because this is a group of volunteers uh, which we were able to like um, identify in Pakistan, and they they heard about this project because SOS Village in Pakistan they uh, like you know they put it they shared it on their social media that they are now part of this initiative about studying trauma in children, and then it turned out that I was approached by um, like a guy who owns this huge diagnostic lab there, and he said that he gets like a lot of young adults who come here for their routine seminal fluid screening. Um, or some of them come there for their infertility assessments. And he said that a lot of these individuals are saying that, you know, um, after hearing about this, we would like to disclose that we were traumatized, like, you know, as during our childhood, and we would like to be assessed. We would like to find out if there are changes in our germline, um, which could then lead to increased risk or susceptibilities in our children. So we ended up having like a group of volunteers, which was, which uh, in total mounted to about 90 individuals, and then we did like um, uh, sort of like you would say like a, through using validated tools, we did a systematic assessment of the trauma exposures in their childhood, and we found out that one the childhood trauma was very common. Um, and, you know, like here you would see that there were many individuals who either were exposed to death of a parent or parental separation due to other reasons, traumatic sexual experience, physical victimization, severe illness or injury, or other significant traumatic experiences which range from um, witnessing like a terrorist attack to, to having like a friend commit a suicide, like all these different exposures. And then from those uh, individuals, those volunteers, we did like an assessment of their seminal fluid. Uh, this is just like showing the severity of all these different trauma exposures. And you, can, you would see that uh, traumatic sexual experiences were rated as the most severe ones. But all of these different exposures, in fact, um, are leading to severe subjective perception of trauma. Um, yeah, this part is the most important one. So based on the germline assessments, the sperm assessments, we found out that there were changes, significant changes in the sperm which we collected from these individuals. What you would also see over here is that these changes are actually based on the severity of the exposure. So here there is CTQ0. CTQ stands for Childhood Trauma Questionnaire. So CTQ0 means people who did not have any significant childhood trauma versus CTQ1, which is significant to at least one significant trauma exposure in childhood, so before the age of 17 years. And this is CTQ2, which is um, like, you know, uh, experiencing at least two significant traumatic events before the age of 17. And what we see is that the expression of these regulatory molecules is dependent on that. We saw the step ladder pattern. So with increased severity, increased exposure to trauma, there was 
this abnormal pattern which was getting like you know accentuated when we compared the the things at a statistical level and when we compared no trauma exposure in the germline to exposure to at least two or more traumatic events, we found that there were significant differences in all these different regulatory molecules. Now, again, I would not go into too much details at the, at the molecular level, but what I can tell you is that these different regulatory molecules, they give susceptibility to more depression. They are important for control of metabolism, and they are important for you know, the general well-being and um, what, what you would call like, you know, a resilience level in the individuals. And we see that these things are affected in the germline. So the offspring, which is likely to result, is going to carry all these risks as well. This, by the way, is the first human study of its kind where we have looked at the effects of early life trauma directly on the germline. So putting it all together, what we have found out based on extensive studies in mice and its validation in humans is that traumatic stress, especially early in life, is leading to changes in whole body metabolism. These changes in whole body metabolism manifest by changing these regulatory molecules in the blood, which then are carried on to the germline, and it has a risk of susceptibility transmission to the next generation. Now, importantly, studying this at the scientific level also gives us windows of opportunity, windows where we can make interventions, interventions which are not only at an individual level, but together with all of you, we'll, we'll find out if there are interventions which we can do at a larger community or society level as well. So at an individual level, what we know is that, you know, for parents who are planning to conceive, we can do certain things to, one, promote their mental well-being through providing them enriched environments. Now this is an intervention which has to start early in life for it to be most beneficial. And then other things where we can try to mitigate these negative effects in cholesterol metabolism we see. And these effects which, um, which could be like, you know, uh, altered by supplementation with polyunsaturated fatty acids, which improve the good cholesterol in the blood, which we saw in mice and in the human study that early life trauma was decreasing. The second thing is is there something which can be done at the time of conception? Now, what we do know is that now there are techniques which, of course, it will take a lot of time until we find whether they are operational, whether they are safe in humans, and we also have to look into the whole ethical dynamics of it. But there are techniques where we can now edit the epigenome. And at least in animals, we can see by using those if the effects are then less transmitted to the next generation. Importantly, what can be done after the offspring is born? Now, the important thing is that here, clinicians, pediatricians, um, you know, like um, people who work with children, they need to be very well affair, aware of what are the risks which could be transmitted. And that's where we need to identify the susceptibilities earlier. We need to do screenings. We need to take parental exposure histories in the clinics. You know, like in the clinics, we always focus on genetic histories, but it's important to also now focus on epigenetic histories, you know, exposure-based histories to identify what are the risks which are getting transmitted to the next generation. And then talking about the lessons for peace builders, I think it's very important that these things are communicated at a larger level. We definitely need to raise awareness that there is a transmission of perturbations at the behavioral level, at the metabolic level, at the disease level, you know, at, at, at a very large level, which are just stemming from early life 
trauma exposures. And people need to be more aware of that. I like, you know, what I would love to see is a world where when I talk about this, people don't get fascinated anymore. I want that everyone should be aware of that. I want that this is something which starts appearing, you know, in textbooks and mainstream media, uh, because we need that before people will actually start to make policies about it. First, we need awareness. Then this gap between the academicians working on it and the people who are actually going to make a difference, that needs to be bridged. And that is, again, where initiatives like neuroscience and peace building could be the key. We need to create a consensus about it. You know, so for example, like when, I, when we talk about the windows of opportunity, now a lot of questions arise which are, you know, not only scientific in nature, but also, you know, we need to know, like, you know, whether when we do these interventions, if eventually we'll be doing these interventions, what will be the ethics of it, whether it's okay to do epigenome editing, whether it's okay to ask for parental history of exposures. Now, I can only tell you that science has shown the evidence for that, but whether this will be well received by the wider community or not, that is something which we need to collectively put our heads together and find out. I mean, I think in the end, the goal is the same. We want less suffering. We want less suffering in children, we want less suffering in the next generation, and we just need to sit together and find out optimal ways in which this can be achieved. And definitely having integrated programs. Now, my work with the SOS Village was actually a starting point of that. Like, you know, SOS Village, irrespective of whatever we worked on, they would continue to take care of these children anyways. But now they have a scientific basis and they can actually make interventions which will also be received by academicians. We, what we tried to do was that not only um, did we screen these children from, for all these uh, sort of perturbations, but we also provided them support wherever we could. Especially working in Pakistan, we were able to, through our screenings, identify children who were anemic, and we provide them nutritional support. We started an intervention program in which we are giving cod liver oil to the children to increase their um, good cholesterol levels, their HDL levels. And what we actually see is that the children who have been supplemented with cod liver oil for at least six months, they start to show less depressive behaviors. So the interventions are also working, and this collaboration with the SOS Village has been like very beneficial to that. So it started from Pakistan. Then I was approached recently by someone from um, Rwanda, and they wanted to implement it over there. Um, somebody from Macedonia approached me, and like you know, that this is this is the sort of platform we needed to spread the message and to implement it at a larger level, which is not only good for the scientific community but also humanity in general. And lastly, I'll just briefly mention my my personal story of struggle. So, so you would find out that the, all these names which I'm mentioning over here, New York Times, Guardian, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, I have not managed to publish in any of those. I have tried to publish in each one of those because I wanted this message to be conveyed. So over the last one year, my first attempt, detention of immigrant children for a man affected generations for the mankind. I sent it actually to all these different, like, you know, mainstream uh, newspapers, magazines. It was rejected. So I was like, okay, Ali, maybe, like, it was very strongly worded. Maybe I wanted to, I don't know, signal towards a particular person. Maybe that wasn't the right way to go. So I changed the title. Family separation, a possible crisis for generations. Still, it was rejected. Next attempt, if we fail our children, their children will not forget. I think maybe by this time it became too romantic and I, I, should, I should have stopped trying, but I still tried, it was not accepted. Um, then there has been a recent uh, you know, political conflict in, in, in Kashmir, so where again the children are being detained. So I collaborated with an Indian neuroscientist. We turn it around a little bit. Um, and we are like an Indian and a Pakistani neuroscience perspective. So we thought if we both teamed up, maybe it will be better received. 
because there is no political angling there, and there are two you know, people who belong to two countries which have been in conflict for a long time, but if they're writing something together, it means that it's pure collaborative science and nothing else. Still, it was rejected. So the key message here is that somehow what we do as scientists, like, you know, our, our, our passion, um, our curiosity, our compassion, all of them help us to identify these pathways. We can come up with predictive models. We can come up with very strong scientific rational to put behind things. But I think in terms of communication, maybe we need to learn more and maybe you guys need to teach us how to communicate better. Or maybe you can serve as that means of communication to mainstream media, to policymakers. I believe that maybe if one of you would write that piece, you know, perhaps it has a much better chance of, of, of getting accepted, of having the impact it's supposed to have. And I think in the end, like for me at a personal level, um, so this is, you know, what, what I was telling Colette as well, like I lost my father at the age of 13. For me, this project, the reason why it's so close to my heart is because I have experienced it personally. And I know the implications of losing your parents early in life would have for these individuals. Importantly, it's not only for these individuals, it's for generations and generations of mankind. And I think this is where we all need to put our forces together and try to spread this message as much as possible. Um, recently, very recently, I've started this survey um, in which we are trying to find out if people are actually aware whether something like epigenetic inheritance could exist in humans. Um, the results, the preliminary results, are not very promising. It seems like people do know that, you know, they, 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 they think that, okay, there could be a psychological transmission, but very few people are aware that there is actually an effect on the germline by early life trauma and similar other experiences which could be transmitted. So we need to spread the message more. And finally, I would like to thank like all the people, like you know, in my lab, um, you know, my, my my friends, my family, which have contributed in different capacities to this work and and have kept me sane enough to pursue this challenge. So thank you very much, and I'd love to take any questions. Thank you, Ollie, first of all, for your presentation and walking us through the research and making it so accessible. That's a skill set that already you've started on the bridging the gap and um, working in ways to integrate your research with the SOS Village and other platforms. And also thank you for your personal commitment. It's very apparent um, that this is important for for mankind and humankind and womankind and all kind, um, and for animals, as you, as you talked about the 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 reality of the effect um, on the biology across the species, um, and so I just want to thank you for your commitment towards that. And it's interesting the big rejected thing, and I think it's probably a time for another discussion, a broader discussion, and we'll start with questions. But I find it very challenging at times when there's something that through research and something that connects and resonates that makes so much sense and for me it was novel a few years ago and now having done so much of the reading and learning from people like you it's just so apparent to me it's hard for me to grasp what is the impediment that it that this aspect of trauma and neuroscience and its nexus to transformation and peace building is, is a hard sell in some way. So that's probably another study of what is it about humans where we reject this. What mm -hmm. is it within us that whether it's at some you know neurobiological level that we reject this in some way. Um, so that would be an interesting study. So let me turn it over to the group and any questions or any thoughts that you have and in anything, whether it's within your program, a question you have about how this could be made applicable, anything that comes up. And we'll go right around. Okay, good. Barbara Smith. 
Okay. Um, I have just first a clarification question regarding the study mm -hmm. that you did with the mothers and, you know, the mice separating mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. and whether the stress that the mother was put through was necessary for observing the effects that you see in the metabolic, metabolic changes that occur afterwards. Yeah. Um, and, and if you thought about doing, you know, the experiment where the mother doesn't, so are there mitigating then effects that this would trigger, right? If the mother only experienced the stress of just the separation but not this additional mm -hmm. stressful event, whether she's more able then to mitigate the effect of the stress that the litter experiences mm -hmm. and would that be transmitted? Because I think for, uh, even though I'm kind of new to the policy arena, <laughs> one of the areas that I'm already very familiar with is, well, what are the mitigating, right? What are the, the ways in which we can help this? And I know you talked a bit at the end more from, um, you know, the cholesterol path, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. but from the more behavioral anxiety, you know, that part, that area, you know, w would that be, you know, a point? So what would be, yeah, the factors that you would see that would be helpful? But first, I guess I want to answer to that yeah, question yeah. about the mother's stress. Right. Yeah, no, thank you very much. These are, these are very important questions. So um, there are two reasons why, like, you know, the, the mothers are stressed in this paradigm. So there are also paradigms of just maternal separation. But what we see in these maternal separation paradigms is that um, after the mothers are united, you know, with their pups and mice, um, they actually try to compensate. So they try to, like, you know, lick and groom the, the pups more. And they just try to be better, you know, in a way more nurturing mothers after they are reunited. So they really try to compensate. And when they are compensating, we see that the transmission across you know, generations does not take place. So they are able to somehow compensate for this period of separation. And that is good to know. That is good to know. But the, the other thing is that we also want it to be um, like a little bit realistic, because a lot of times mothers who are separated you know, from their children are forcibly separated from their children. So we wanted it to be like that, that the, that the mother has this complete uh, a behavioral experience in which, you know, she is separated from the pups and she's struggling during that time, which is very applicable to what we see in, in terms of, like, you know, a lot of different conflicts. Even, like, you know, for example, in our children cohort, these mothers, like, you know, they forcibly were separated from their children just because they could not, they did not have the financial means to raise the children on their own. Um, so these are the two reasons. But, yeah, it's important that if those mothers, like, you know, uh, if they're not stressed themselves, then they try to compensate by being, like, you know, over-nurturing in their behavior. Uh, in terms of mitigating factors, we also know that giving an enriched environment to these mice after the trauma exposure, it does partially reverse, like, some of the transmitted symptoms. Um, and what I mean here um, in this, like, environment enrichment is that, you know, mice are usually kept in cages in the, in the laboratory. But then um, if you make their cages, if you turn them into mouse playgrounds, if you provide them different like, you know, um, toys they can play with, if they have a running wheel where they can do their exercise voluntarily, if you put them like, you know, put little mazes in their, in their cages where they go and if they press a lever, they will get a reward. If you give them this nurturing exploratory environment, then we see that uh, the, the, the brain connectivity becomes more positive in them, and then also the transmission of the phenotypes across generations, it is partially reversed. So again, good mothering would compensate for that, and environment enrichment for compensate for that. Um, well, you answered one of my questions, but another one was um, whether there were differential effects based on the type of trauma that was experienced. You indicated kind of the um, the the intensity mm -hmm. I think was, was my interpretation of yeah. of that was there different types of effects that you observed um, yeah that that's again a very important question so what we see is that um, you know like in these in this study of adult men where we look at the germline changes um, 
the trauma severity is perceived as the highest for traumatic sexual experience early. Um, but be, are the other, all other traumas, like, you know, they are more or less at the same severity level. Um, what we have analyzed so far is that with increasing severity, we see increased dysregulation of these regulatory molecules in the germline. But at the next step, we will separate the effects of all these different trauma exposures. Um, but generally, I think that the important thing is that the one which stands out is the traumatic sexual experience. All the other different traumas, they are considered to be more or less at the same severity level. Oh, yes, please, yeah. So one was a comment, and then one was a question. Um, the comment is kind of related to what you were alluding to, Colette, is why is this so difficult to break through? And this is a very general comment and observation, not science-based. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, with this, this um, understanding comes a level of responsibility that um, it's kind of like climate change, you know, this ability to accept responsibility for what I can do to affect future generations or society's responsibility to care for those who are traumatized through their own fault or no, something they did in a violent situation or something that was done to them. But the level of responsibility when you get this information increases dramatically. And I think that's a very hard barrier to overcome. Um, as humans, so I don't know the answer to that, but <laughs> it's worth the thought of um, what this means. The comment is a little, the question is based on the comment about that they become less sociable. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's what we're grappling with, whether it's in the work that you're, um, Mona, you're doing with Leanne, um, and how we, how we work with the individual effects of the individual, individual, but what what do we need to do at the community level, right? What do we need to do to, to bridge those bonds? Um, it makes sense that they would isolate themselves and become less sociable, but it, this gives us more to think about in terms of what are the interventions to mitigate right, what this individual has experienced. And so how do we rebuild those social bonds when this person has clearly lost the ability to do that, but it's so critical to our, our human experience? So um, I don't know if it's a question so much as I think we need to better understand that impact of, of them becoming less sociable. Yeah. Um, so I would mention like a couple of things. It's, it's again like a very important question and something which, which I've been asking myself, you know, because that's interventions which are applicable to humans. Eventually they are the key. You know, that's, that's the level which we want to reach. Mm -hmm. So I'd mentioned three things. One which was in this talk that we do see that, um, you know, even like, you know, in the, in the human cohort, uh, we see like uh, an inverse correlation between the, um, the levels of HDL and the depressive behaviors they show. So the ones who have low HDL are also the ones who have the highest, uh, you know, the more severe manifestation of depression. I believe that this is something which probably is applied to their social isolation as well, because social isolation is something which goes hand in hand with depression. Um, we are going to study that also at the behavioral level, and then see if cod liver oil, the way it is affecting depressive behaviors, if it also has a benefit in terms of sociability. There are two other things. So one is that, um, uh, like, you know, actually, like, I've recently become an independent group leader, and I've started some projects which are more at the, at the intervention level. And something which we first want to try out in, the, in these uh, mouse studies is what, what we call social environment in, in, uh, enrichment. So when we turn these mouse cages into a playground, what we want to do is to put a foster mother there and to mix litters, you know, to put like siblings from one litter together with siblings from another litter to give them a feeling of a larger community and they are becoming in a way part of a different family of mice. And then we want to see if that will have a mitigating effect. So if you ask me in a year, I would have like, you know, some uh, more like solid observations about that. Uh, the third thing which we are now like, um, we recently actually wrote a proposal for that is to use virtual reality uh, to do, to provide 
psychotherapy in these children because psychotherapy is something which um, generally like children are not, you know, they, they kind of run away from that. Also talking to an adult who you do not strongly connect to and sharing your like traumatic experiences, I don't think children find it easy to do that. You know, a, a rapport needs to be established and usually child psychologists, I don't think they are spending too much time with the children, you know, in their, in their, in their daily living to reach that level. So what we are trying to do is to provide psychotherapy in virtual reality-based immersive environments. So in the end, children like to explore, you know. I mean, even when they want to remain isolated, even those children are up for playing a video game in virtual reality. Now we will provide them psychotherapy in this virtual reality-based immersive environment and see if it's going to lead to any additional beneficial outcomes of that. So we are doing some interventions and hopefully we will get to a point where we can, uh, we'll find a way to reverse as many symptoms as possible. One thing that Rose said, and just extend the question one step further, with the interventions with the children through, um, you know, the headsets or something like that for virtual reality, and then you talked about periods of intervention where they're most responsive, and I know I had a little stress out when I found out that it's for males, it's 15 to 17 year olds, and I have a 16 year old. So I thought, oh, I'm in right in the middle of a crucial period of where, where, where you can intervene, but also things could happen. So that was enlightening, something I did not know until today. And so I'm curious, if we're dealing primarily, at least in the work we're doing, I know definitely with peace building development, some work with the, the, the youth population, children, if you're dealing with primarily adults, mm -hmm. or even if they're on the younger side, you're talking late teens, early 20s, is there anything around interventions that, you know, one might say, well, it's, we're all too old now? Or is it, you know, are there windows of opportunity that close at a certain point? Yeah, I, I would say that uh, they do not close. Um, the, the, the levels of efficacy might be different, you know. Um, so probably like an, any kind of intervention, you know, I think if it's done before they become adults, before the age of 18, is more likely to be efficacious. Um, but I, I think like in the end, definitely any intervention is going to be better than no intervention. You know, so I think that is also something which we need to keep in, to, in, keep in mind. Um, Importantly, before they conceive, like, you know, um, which, you know, most of these individuals do, let's say, around the age of, you know, 30 years, like, let's say, roughly. So I think before that, any intervention would definitely decrease the risk. Now, whether they themselves benefit from that intervention, that probably is going to be a bit less the more delayed it is, you know. So early would always be better. But yeah, I, I would say that any intervention is, is better than no intervention, even in adulthood. Um, I'm not sure if this is a question you can answer, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, so we work a lot with, um, in conflict-affected communities, likely trauma-affected communities, um, but, tr but working on kind of intercommunal dynamics, trying to like reduce bias, kind of what was, that came up in the last neuroscience presentation, um, and build kind of intercommunal uh, co cohesion to a certain degree. Um, and sometimes I worry we're working with these trauma-affected communities, the absorptive capacity of, of, a, of a 17 year old um, who's experienced trauma is limited, is limited and it's limiting our ability to actually get, reach them. And that to a certain degree, like our work is kind of it's like what we need to be doing this work, addressing trauma first before we get to the stage of doing any trainings on dialogue mediation, on living in a diverse society, these sorts of things. Um, wh what would you say to to that type of an intervention? Would you like? Is it um, are are there things we need to be keeping in mind when we're designing interventions like that um, with a trauma affected community? on intergroup dynamics and the us versus them. So that field of neuroscience and social psychology linked with 
your field? How, how, where are those connections, and is there a primacy of one over, or, or yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so I would say that, um, I mean, the, like what you ask is very crucial. You know, I, I think in the in the neuroscience field, I um, at least to my knowledge, this has not been studied, like you know, at at a level where let's say we have studied trauma. I think it's very important to also like you know study these these biases, these like you know prejudices between communities. Um, it's a, it is a bit it's 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 hard to model those things into laboratories because. You know, communities like you know, let's say in 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 mice, they are based on this hierarchical structure of strength. You know, uh, but it is not; it doesn't have the same kind of biases which we see in humans. Um, what I can tell you is like this: this uh, this other uh, project which which we have written up in which we are again using immersive environments to see how communities would relate to each other better if we if they themselves feel that they are belonging to the other community you know so so imagine it's like this like uh, let's say if we if we want to get more insight about misogyny or and decrease it you would see a populations of, of men who would see themselves as women in the avatar in this immersive environment and then what we are trying to do at the same time is to detect activity in the parts of the brain which are known to induce empathy if this relatability by looking at themselves as belonging to the other gender, or you can apply it to other race, et cetera, whether it would lead to more empathy towards that particular one. Um, I think finding these things at the molecular level, still we are like far from it. Um, what there are some new techniques in which you can access, like you know, the molecular architecture of the neurons by converting blood cells into neurons. And that is something which, which, which can be used to study the molecular signatures of that. Um, but yeah, I think that that field needs to be explored further, definitely, yeah. Yes, please, yeah. Thanks. So as you've been speaking, I've been uh, pondering the complexity of a place like the El Hall Displacement Camp, which is you know nearly 70,000 primarily women, primarily children, two-thirds are children. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how what you're talking about, and in particular, what, what, what do interventions look like in that kind of setting? And in particular, I think I'd highlight two characteristics. One is um, that it is a camp setting, and that in particular, you know, in the annex where uh, foreign mothers and their children live, it's highly, highly controlled. There's no ability really to move around very freely. Um, so this idea of freedom of movement, ability to play, et cetera, um, in a healthy way is, it seems to not be there. But more importantly, these are children that have already experienced trauma by virtue of having lived you know, in the caliphate and witnessed, and even in some cases been coerced or compelled into committing themselves atrocities. And their mothers, in some instances, are radicalized and um, will often inhibit their, or forbid them from uh, participating in any sort of psychosocial activity that's being felt. And that's, pr that's prompting a big debate about the whole question of separation mm -hmm. of children from their mothers, where in this instance, the mothers who are radicalized may in fact be an inhibiting factor to their healing. So mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering what you think about all of that. And then lastly, sort of how, if at all, do you see the intersection of radicalization with trauma? Yeah, um, it's, it's a very crucial question, but I, I do feel that I'm perhaps not qualified to answer it you know in a, in a way that I could suggest an intervention um, but I think it's it's important to again study this you know first to see what is happening you know like we need to model it you know um, maybe in mice in which we actually induce violence in the mothers you know and make their maternal care not impaired but going towards more like you know the sort of this you know, this radicalization which you talk about, and then see what is happening to the offspring and then whether it will be better for them
to have foster care compared to living with like a radicalized mother. I think um, what I would say is that definitely any kind of maternal care is important, you know, especially early in life. Um, if there is a foster care which compensates for it, you know, even when let's say the, the, the original mother, like, you know, biological mother is giving a more um, sort of violent or radicalized care, then I think maybe it's better. But I think having maternal care is very important. That's, that's what we have seen, uh, like, you know, that's what we observed in animals, that's what we found out from the SOS Children's Village uh, by working with them as well. I mean, so they do provide foster care, you know, to these children. They even give them, like, you know, these um, sort of family units in which they have siblings and together they live with their mother. But still we see that having this, you know, foster mom does not lead to, like, you know, uh, mitigation of all these uh, neurobehavioral symptoms and metabolic defects. So I think having maternal care is definitely important. But we, we need to study that. I think it's very important to study that before we come up with a recommendation. Yes, please. Sir. Um, I have two questions. The yes, first please. is I was interested when you were talking about intermarriage in Pakistan because yes. um, I'm from Palestine and mm -hmm. there's also a lot of intermarriage there yeah. and also a lot of collective trauma. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if you think that that cultural tradition of intermarriage may in fact make the trauma more severe. Definitely it does. And then the second question was just which organizations we should be on the lookout that are looking to spread awareness um, about the link between uh, trauma and epigenetics. Yeah, so great. Um, so the first question, definitely. So what, what I can tell you is that uh, these, you know, intermarriages, so there, there are, so in, in Pakistan, there are two different kinds of consanguinities. You know, one is cousin marriages. And the other one is, they call it like intra, intra biradri marriages, which is basically, they follow the male lineages, mm -hmm. you know, generations across generations. Mm -hmm. And then it's not a cousin marriage, but still you're staying with the same gene pool. Right. And um, so on its own, it causes many genetic disorders, like, you know, intellectual disability, uh, like, you know, the spectral disorders, autism spectrum disorders, a lot of these are, you know, what we call autosomal recessive. So these are recessive genes which get um, sort of, um, you would say that they get multiplied, they get amplified because of these, like, you know, intra, like, uh, biradri marriages or these consanguineous marriages. Um, another thing which we see is that these, like, marriages within, within you know, your consanguineous group, it leads to increased anxiety. So, and we don't know the basis for it, but based on like, you know, what we study over here, it seems like that's an additional factor which would make these populations even more vulnerable to trauma compared to like, you know, let's say a more diverse, genetically more diverse population. Mm -hmm. So definitely it is an additional uh, negative impact, which is going over there. In terms of foundation, so I think like I do know that anything which gets published in the mainstream media, it gets highlighted way more than a scientific paper. Mm -hmm. The thing is that also it depends on how you want to portray your science. Like, you know, I, I've been trained, you know, I've been lucky enough to be trained by very rigorous scientists. Mm -hmm. And we try not to sort of hyperbole our findings. You know, we talk in very rigorous scientific terms. Mm -hmm. um, somehow what, what we feel is that mainstream media doesn't buy that. They want you to come up with something like really kind of like, you know, out of the world. Um, I think it's important that we find a bit of a balance in between. And if we started doing things which are more at the, at the policy making level at like, you know, the human rights activists, lawyers, if these kind of organizations, they start having more discussions about it, it would really help out. And again, I think an article in New York Times is equivalent to like a five articles in Nature or Science. In the end, it's still that that remains like the fact of this world, and we we, we can't change that. But I think we need to sort of target mainstream media more. Um, like I would I would talk about like one particular um, example. So it's it's actually like a good friend of mine. I worked with him at some point when I was interested in the topic. It's 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 actually like um, a Syrian uh, public health researcher. Um, who worked a lot on shisha smoking, shisha and like water pipe, you know, and smoking. 
And um, he was the first one to actually show that one session of shisha smoking is equivalent to like 40 cigarette mm -hmm. um, uh, smoking sessions. And, and then his work actually led to a lot of awareness and a lot of policy making things. You know, in, in many of these um, like, you know, countries in the Middle East, shisha smoking was not subjected to the same regulation which, you know, like right. cigarette smoking is too. And then just his work led to this policy making change in which they were like, okay, if we don't sell cigarettes to people under 18, we are not going to offer shisha to like, you know, uh, individuals under 18 as well. So those kind of things would really make a difference if we somehow can get it to policy makers and mainstream media, mm -hmm. that's gonna really going to help. Yes, please. First, thank you for your lightning presentation. Thank you. Uh, my question uh, deals basically with the um, offspring and the genes and whatnot. So in a situation where you have a parent that was traumatized in their lifetime who then, um, I guess, through the epigenetic inheritance passes on that trauma through the offspring, um, have you come across any findings where those like trauma gene expressions remain dormant in the childhood of the offspring and become activated in the offspring's adult life? Mm -hmm. um, maybe do some type of trigger points and whatnot. I'm not sure if you've come across any findings like that. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's again like a very important question and I'm sure that um, you know, some of these susceptibilities, like you know, um, they would lead to manifestations under certain conditions and not under the other conditions. For example, like, you know, in, 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 in the mice, we see that there are changes at the cholesterol level, right? Now, let's say if we further subjected the offspring to high fat diet, probably already having like, you know, dyslipidemia, this kind of bad cholesterol profile would further accentuate that. Um, similarly, if they are further exposed to stresses, probably the risk would even amplify more. Um, the reason why we have tried not to expose these mice to these for additional stressors actually is for purely ethical reasons. I mean, we think that already, like, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's um, never good to be involved in work which are voluntarily doing something in which you are stressing these little, you know, pups. So if we, we just tried not to expose them to further stresses, but we can predict that definitely the, the, the effects would be amplified a lot more if there were. And definitely we, we see changes, you know, like all the microRNA changes we see, they show that um, there would be a lot more cardiovascular effects in these mice under certain conditions. They will develop like a lot of different manifestations, like very bad manifestations under certain Stresses, yeah. A few more minutes. Any other questions? I guess just one more uh, question regarding what the CSO's children get um, in that environment, because it is kind of depressing to find out that they are showing these markers, right? Even though they are in an environment that presumably is trying to help them, and I. I guess I just want your observations as to what do you think is missing in that particular environment. Mm -hmm. I know you mentioned that they had foster parents, mm -hmm. but somehow that's not right coming through. Um, do you think is that particular kind of foster parenting that model that is not helping or is it something else about the entire environment. I guess I don't know enough about, yeah. So I'm just, again, I'm just, yeah, thinking, okay, how, you know, if that doesn't help, mm -hmm. it would seem, yeah, what? Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll try to explain it this way, that, um, you know, like, so, like, our metabolism depends a lot on what we eat, right? And if we have, like, a healthy lifestyle, and, like, you know, if we eat more balanced diet, then we are less likely to develop like you know um, cholesterol related disorders uh, but if we eat unhealthy we are more likely now there are certain people who are born with what we call familial hypercholesterolemia no matter what they eat their cholesterol levels would always be impaired 
So for them, we need even more rigorous dietary interventions, exercise-based interventions. So I would say that something very similar applies to these children, that just giving them foster care and just giving them like you know an environment where they get like somewhat of like a healthy diet and schooling and stuff like other children, it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient to completely mitigate the susceptibilities which they have been like you know passed on. I think importantly in these cases we need to take additional measures. We need to give them like you know we need to make their environment even more enriching. We need to find ways in which somehow um, they get like you know a psychotherapy over a course of a lifetime where these issues are addressed. So I think like you know what what the SOS village people are doing that's 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 great. But actually our studies, uh, like you know, and other other people who if if they're doing similar work, we are going to help them optimize that care to reach to a level where we see that the these these effects are completely mitigated or as as mitigated as possible. Um, actually, I had like a very um, important, crucial discussion with um, one of the psychologists who was taking care of these children, and she was like, "You know, we do everything for them. You know, they 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 get like a family-like environment, they get schooling, but she doesn't understand why a lot of children who were under her care they would wake up in the night and have nightmares. You know, and this these are the things where we need to do more." and where we need to study more and find out more pathways which are getting affected and find ways to reverse those. Hi, um, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, please. Oh, hi, um, I'm, I'm calling in from Peru. Thank you so much for, for this presentation. Um, I'm Rebecca Kinyon, and I'm just wondering if you've looked at all at the role of the vagus nerve um, vagal theory, um, you know, stimulating the vagus nerve to help increase well-being. And um, as a neuroscientist, I'd be very, I mean, since you're the neuroscientist, I'd be very interested to hear if you've looked at the role of the vagus nerve and perhaps we can, that would be a good way to create societal level interventions if we can't work one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. so much with each individual person, but activities that would promote stronger vagal tone, like um, meditation, yoga, group singing, group dancing, this type of thing. Mm -hmm. Just real quickly, Rebecca is with the State Department. Okay, great, great. Thanks a lot. That's, that's um, again, that's, that's a very nice question. I, I, I would actually call it a suggestion, and that's not something which we have looked into. Um, but, like, you know, I, I do know that, like, all these activities and mindfulness and vagus nerve stimulation, in, in, in different ways, I mean, it has very strong, like, um, antidepressive effects. So that is definitely an intervention which should be started, um, I would say. At this point, you know, like, a lot of this was, until a year ago, a lot of this was work was done in mice, where we looked at the things at more molecular level. Like, the human part of it is more recent, um, so that's why we do not have many intervention studies which um, have been published as of yet, but a lot of things are in the pipeline. And I'd love to talk more about this vagus nerve thing with you, if, if that would be possible. I would love that, too. <laughs> Thank, right. you. Thank you. Is there anyone else online that would like to ask a question? OK, great. Um, so again, I wanted to thank um, Ollie for his very, very interesting, that we hope will not be so interesting, in the future, but will become such common sense and integrated that we'll be talking about at the grocery store with you know the person standing next to us in line, and there will be interventions, and it'll all just be so normalized and part of our day to day. That's the vision. Um, so thanks so much, Ollie, and thanks to everyone here as well as who um, is participating in the live uh, online version. And I wanted to thank um, Tina. Lou and Angelina Mendez for all of the work that you have done to make this possible, this event possible, as well as the other events that we've held around neuroscience and peace building. The first one was on resilience, and we talked about some of the interventions, and we talked a lot about polyvagal theory um, through one of the 
the participants and then Angelina talked about her work and we talked about mindful meditation through um, someone who's with our military who works with soldiers on mindfulness and meditation as a resilience tool. Um, the second one was just a few weeks ago, which was on um, Emile Bruneau from Beyond Conflict was here and talked about his research, um, intergroup dynamics, looking at dehumanization, um, the us versus them issue, and some of the interventions around that. And so um, all of you are our third. So thank you so much. And all of them will be available um, online in parts um, the, so that people can watch them later. So again, thank you, Angelina. It's been a pleasure all throughout. And Tina, this would not have been possible without both of you. So thanks, everybody, on a Friday afternoon. We're giving back three minutes of your time. So what are you going to do with it? <laughs> so thank you.